Welcome to Built to Win, the podcast created to help you level up your business game by developing a success mindset made for the long run. In this episode, breaking down the micro entrepreneurship boom, Amber Olson Rourke and Dave Fleming dig into the booming gig economy and break down the different opportunities that exist, the advantages and disadvantages of each one, and what you need to consider before you make the leap into starting your own business or side hustle. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Built to Win, our podcast built for entrepreneurs and people who are in leadership positions or people who are just looking for more out of life and looking for like-minded individuals and content that that fits right into your thought process and the things that you're looking for in a world full of all kinds of different media. This is This is for you. And today we are diving into a little bit of a different topic than we've previously covered. And I, I would highly recommend that you listen to our previous episodes. Go ahead and, and find those wherever you listen to your podcasts and go ahead and listen to the, the previous episodes. You'll kind of get a better feel for what this is all about, some of the topics that we've covered in the past. And, uh, and today we're going to dive into something, like I said, a little bit different and we're going to be diving into the rise of micro entrepreneurship. And this is going to be a conversation with our co-host and co-founder of this podcast, the president and chief sales marketing officer and co-founder of Neora, Amber Olson Rourke. Amber, always a pleasure to have you on and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I'm excited about this topic. It's definitely a topic that's timely. And I think um, a lot of people are interested in, but might not know kind of what they should be thinking of related to it. Absolutely. And, you know, up front, I'm going to let our listeners know, like we, we obviously, this is our opinion on things. We, we do have some biases. We're not going to pretend that we don't. So if, uh, if we say something that you don't agree with, that's totally fine. We, uh, we don't expect everybody to agree with everything that we say, but we are going to lay out what we think. And I think that our biases are based in some strong data. And I think that our opinions are based on experience, data, and what we've seen in the marketplace. And so hopefully this is of great value, but we're going to be diving into you know, what it means to be an entrepreneur. I know a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs or thinking about becoming entrepreneurs. And we've heard so much about the rise of micro entrepreneurship. It's one of the things that we hear a lot about in the space that we're in, but you know, this is something that you and I have talked a lot about, Amber. I think, you know, from your perspective, what are you seeing out there? Like what's exciting to you about what is happening in the marketplace right now? I think in general, just the democratization of entrepreneurship, if you look, think back, you know, even 50 years, you had to uh, invest a ton of money to become an entrepreneur. You know, maybe you could get into a franchise um, opportunity, but again, it was going to require so much upfront investment. And now there's just so many different options that can get you started on the path to entrepreneurship. And so I think um, that is exciting, but I, that can also create confusion because there are so many different options. So I think, you know, our goal here is to help people kind of cipher through the pros and cons of all the different options. And what are the things that remain the true, regardless of like which particular path you choose? There are some things that you need to consider as an entrepreneur when you're selecting what it is that you want to do. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the things that are that are on the list, like as you're as you're looking for opportunities, and you've decided entrepreneurship is is something you want to do, something you want to pursue. This is, and again, this is our list. These are things that we think that you should be looking at in terms of the decision you make about being an entrepreneur. And I and I think for me, number one, it starts with the market opportunity, and and this one it sounds kind of obvious. And maybe to some people, some, a lot of our listeners, it probably is obvious, but when you're looking at an opportunity, you want to obviously get into markets where there is growth opportunity, right? I think like if someone, if someone said that they were going to start an eight track distribution business right now, or a cassette tape distribution business, that would be a pretty niche market and maybe not a huge market value opportunity. Certainly wouldn't say that there's no opportunity but it's something to consider. Like if you're going to get into business, like where do you want to be in business? Do you want to be in growth areas or do you want to be in niche areas? And, and what is it that you're wanting to accomplish with your business? Yeah. And I, I definitely agree. And I think the second element kind of ties right into that is, do you have a value proposition 
that's going to meet that market opportunity differently or better than other people already are. Like there's some areas, you know, that are, that have a ton of demand, a ton of opportunity, but they're super saturated. And if you enter a super saturated market and you have no differentiation, you know, have no, you know, exclusivity of why, what you're offering is different or a unique value proposition on how you're really going to meet the needs of a consumer different way, it's going to be really hard to break through. We always talk about, you know, that you are, you're really not selling a product, you're selling a solution to a need. And so that's where really understanding how can you create a solution that's truly unique to meet that market opportunity. So it's not enough that there is a market opportunity. You also have to be able to have that value proposition to capitalize on that market opportunity. That is such a good point, Amber, because I think thinking back to like the, the years that I spent working in Silicon Valley, there was, there was so much great tech. There's so many cool things that people were doing that, that were cool and they were innovative and they were, they were groundbreaking, but they weren't really solving a problem for people in the marketplace. And so they, they right. ultimately, they end up not going anywhere because, because there's no consumers that need it. And, and I remember one of my favorite clips from Steve Jobs is him talking at a, at a, I believe it's at a shareholders meeting and he's talking to one of the shareholders who's raising, like, why aren't you selling better tech? Like, why are you settling essentially was the question. And Steve Jobs, well, he said, you know, it really, it comes to the user experience and the, and the customer, like we're solving customers problems, not trying to sell really cool technology and try to prove to people that, that they need it because they're going to decide they're going to, their right. dollars are going to decide what they need and don't need. Um, and that's, that's something like, as you're, as we're, as we're, you know, as, as our listeners are deciding like what business you want to get into, which, which by the way, the, the statistic that I read recently is that, you know, based on, based on one particular survey, there's as many as 50% of the population in the United States and in North America is planning on starting a business within the next five years. So I, I think we're, we're coming at a very relevant time for people as they're considering what they're going to do. And one of the things as you're looking at a, at a business is the startup or the ongoing cost of being in business, you know, and there's so many different businesses you can choose from, but some of them are super capital intensive like you just you need a lot of cash to keep those businesses going and and some are not and that's that's one of the things that should be on your list of things to consider is you know what what is your capital that you're willing to or able to put into the business and and what's the return on that capital yeah and how quick can you get into profit but profitability mode, right? Like it's like, how much is going to have to go in and what would be the things that I would need to happen to get into profit? And is that realistic? You know, if that equation, um, how, realistically, how long could I execute on that equation? So you're kind of really going into it, understanding those costs. I think people sometimes even they know the startup costs, but they don't really think through all of the ongoing costs and that, you know, they think that that is going to be lower than it is. And it kind of catches them by surprise. So it's really, you know, good to understand the whole picture. The other thing I think is really important is knowing um, if there is a repeatable proven system, meaning, and what a repeatable proven system means ultimately is scalability. If you have success at a small level, are you going to be able to scale that to a much bigger level? And so some different entrepreneurship options, you're kind of charting your complete own path. And in some, you're kind of plugging into something where there is uh, a roadmap for you. There is something that is a system that you can repeat and that's going to allow you to scale, which is really important um, for you to be able to not have kind of that glass ceiling, so to speak, in terms of entrepreneurship. And then the last thing I would consider is just, you know, the, the leadership around the actual company or brand, um, or whoever is leading, you know, the ultimate company or, or, or franchise or whatever that you're aligning yourself with all of those things, um, I think are really important and they all kind of work together. And, you know, as the longer you're in business, you, you start to see that any one of these things can, 
uh, if it's not present, take you out of the game. You know, it, it is really important to have all pieces of the puzzle to have long-term sustainability, like to have a business that's going to weather different e economic times, different, um, you know, uh, different uh, changes in the market, just all of the things that you can't, aren't even thinking of that are going to happen. These give you that solid foundation to be more likely to weather whatever it is uh, that comes your way. That, that, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think a lot of people get into business and they're super excited about the business and, and sometimes they overlook what, what we might consider like mission critical point of failure. That's, you know, not setting you up for success from the very beginning. And, and I'm glad you mentioned scalability and the cost of ongoing business. Cause I, I think some people don't realize that, you know, growth in your business can be just as difficult as not growing in terms yes. of capital requirements. Growth can be expensive. <laughs> growth is expensive. All of a sudden you're hiring people and you're trying to keep up. Yes. Yeah, it is massive. It is massively expensive. And so, it's, you know, sometimes, and, and you'll see that, like sometimes you'll see these businesses, you know, and, and sometimes you'll see it in franchises. They get like super popular. I remember, you know, my, my, my wife's um, uncle actually was, was, timed it perfectly when frozen yogurt, this is, this is for some of our older listeners probably <laughs> who remember in the, uh, in the, the like boom the of Froyo. <laughs> Froyo. Yes. Frozen <laughs> yogurt. And, uh, we're kind of seeing a resurgence or maybe a sort of resurgence of frozen yogurt lately, but yeah, I mean, they got in at the right time. They got out at the perfect time, but there were a lot of people who got in at the wrong time right. or stayed too long and ended up it was, and ended up, you know, losing everything basically. Cause they, you know, the, the, the trend end it. Um, so I'm glad you brought point. that up. I think that wasn't even on our original list, but I think that the timelessness of the offer is super important. Like you just mentioned, a, you know, a trend that comes and goes, you're going to have to time it right. And there's some things that are more evergreen, like that demand for that particular, you know, product offering or, or whatever has been around a long time. Um, so the timelessness of it, I think that's a really, you know, like you mentioned tech too, right? That's something that uh, it ages out quickly. So that's, I like, I like that. We're going to add that to the list. <laughs> you should add that to the list. Yes. That's, that's, that's clever of us to include that on our <laughs> list. But I think it's, so, so let's, let's, let's break down some of these. I think this is going to be fun. I think we're, we're going to talk about some of the different businesses that you could get into. And we're, we're going to talk about some that would be considered part of the, the gig economy. And, and when we talk about the gig economy, we, we're talking about people who are doing a, like a generally considered a side gig. And, and I know, we know that there are people who do this and this is their full-time income, whether they're doing one side gig or multiple gigs and, and that creates a full-time income, but we're going to break these down and kind of look at different businesses that you can be in as a, whether it's a side gig or as a full-time thing, or just look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of some of the things that are out there because, you know, the, the side, the side hustle, it used to be called, I don't know, I don't hear that as much anymore, but this is massive. This is huge economics. Like, like we were looking at this, the $455 billion in the global gig economy last year. I mean, that's, that's larger than like most countries, GDPs. I mean, that's how big yeah. this is. And yeah. so people are doing it. Yes. So let's talk about, I know one of the, let's, let's start where, where, you know, one of the most popular ones and, uh, and continues to be very popular, but it's the, it's the, you know, the, the, the Uber or DoorDash or Instacart. Um, it's the, you know, it's the, tr it's the true side gig. It's the, something that you, people generally pick up. And I think a lot of people get started with a side gig because it's, it's low barrier to entry, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 know, you can get, you can sign up for Uber and you can literally be driving like the same day, even, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it's very low barrier to entry. It's flexible. You can drive when you want. You can DoorDash when you want. Um, you know, inter interestingly, like the grocery delivery, like DoorDash and Instacart are, are one of the faster growing segments of the gig economy. And I'm not sure why that is. I'm sure we could do some more research and figure it out, but I assume it's because you can, you can do it when you want to. And the flexibility is, is even more substantial than, than driving for Uber or Lyft or something like that. And it's very kind of a predictable outcome. You know, I do this. I know exactly what I'm going to make. I'm going to get instant kind of gratification of getting that deposited 
Um, so I know if I need to make, you know, if I need to make a hundred dollars by the weekend, this is how many rides I need to do, or this is how many, you know, groceries I need to deliver and it's going to be there. So I think that's really, um, you know, it, it's a, a fast growing segment because of those elements. And then on the con side of side gigs, we're going to do pros and cons for everything. Everything has pros and cons, right? So Absolutely. on the con side of, of that kind of more uh, traditional side gig, there's not a lot of upside potential, you know, like you can be the most amazing Uber driver or DoorDash driver, and there's not like a promotion coming for you. You're, you're kind of, you, you have to work more hours in order to make more money. And you're still really directly trading your time for your money. Like you're not getting paid for Uber or DoorDash if you're not making that delivery in that moment. Um, you know, there's also, you know, there's some fees that can come along with it. Um, and you're, you're, you know, not really in control really to kind of chart your own path. You can do it when you want, but you're still doing, you know, specifically what those companies want you to be doing. You can't really kind of reinvent the wheel and decide to change up Uber's app or where you get to pick people up from the airport. Like a lot of the things are defined, um, for you. So I'd say those are, those are the, the kind of classic pros and cons with, with those options. Yeah, I think I think especially especially with the like the ride sharing apps, that's that's something that people don't necessarily think of is that you know when you when you drive for Uber, two things. One is that Uber is taking a percentage of every ride that you that you give, and so it's not like the Uber was thirty five dollars. The drivers drivers not making thirty five dollars. No, and, I think they make half. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the other thing, and and this was, and I'm not sure what the rates are, what the bonuses are. That they right. they vary by city. But but Uber and Lyft will will pay you a bonus for doing a certain number of rides, but but that number frequently makes it so that you're driving basically every day or or multiple hours or almost full time in order to qualify for those bonuses. And so some of the numbers that you see from Uber may look pretty attractive, but there's always a little bit more behind the behind the curtain so to speak like there's always a little bit more that's going on there that you need to look into before you make that decision and it's like everything else you know there's always there's always more info and you want to make sure that you you look carefully at whatever decision you're going to make and make the right decision for you the yeah. next model we are going to kind of dive into is the more traditional affiliate model so this is you have a link you post that link people buy the product you get paid um, Amazon is a, a well-known, has a well-known affiliate program. Lots of brands have affiliate programs. Um, and some of the, the pros of this is it's very flexible. So you can work it into, uh, if you have a following on social media, um, you can work it into, you know, the content, what you're doing. Um, and it's a pr pretty predictable in terms of, you know, the percentage you're going to get paid. Um, some of the cons I'd say is that, the commission percentage can be quite small. So five to 10% of what you sell. Um, and you're not paid on follow-up sales from that customer base traditionally. So if that customer, you know, most customers don't come back and find your affiliate link and then repurchase them. them. They just go back to the brand and repurchase and all of those follow-up sales, you're not paid on. So you're not able to really build um, any, any true leverage. You know, you're still getting paid on, when people use your link, when you make that content, but it's a, it's a super popular model. And, um, you know, I think Amazon has really grown the, uh, the, the awareness of this model in the marketplace. Oh, for sure. For sure. There's a lot of people now selling on Amazon and, and Amazon, I believe at the time of recording, Amazon is the largest e-commerce website in the world. Um, and, and a lot of people are selling there, but for the people, people who aren't familiar with affiliate marketing, maybe don't realize how much work that really is. And it's, and it's not necessarily because you're in love with a particular product. A lot of really effective affiliate marketers are, are really good at dominating search engine optimization and, and representing products that maybe, maybe, maybe not have an emotional connection to, but they find a niche and they're just really, really good at, at, building out that niche as, as well as they can. And, and it's, it's, it's a grind. Like if you're a really, yeah. really good affiliate marketer, like it is a, it is a lot of work. 
And so that's a good point. Like you can't really just, you know, have, you know, not much social media following or digital marketing knowledge, throw up a few leak, a few links, and then all of a sudden be killing it. You know, like it is an actual, um, you know, dedicated effort for sure. For sure. Yeah. And there's, and there's good money in affiliate marketing. Like if you have a lot of followers on social media and, and you're representing a product and selling through your channel, there's good money to be made there. There's absolutely the case, but a lot of time, but, but you know, growing a following is, is hard work. I mean, it is hard work. It's constant con like con constantly putting content out there. And if you're not putting content out there, you're not getting eyeballs on your media and, and therefore you're not, you're not maximizing your return on it. So, it, you know, it, it is, there's, there's time involved. There's a lot of work into it. Um, I, but again, you know, everything has its pros and its cons and you have to decide for yourself. There's one that I want to talk about. And, and to be honest, I'm not even sure if I totally understand what this is, but I figured it's out there. People are talking about it, but it's, but it's MRR marketing or master reseller rights. Yeah. And like, what is that? So basically it's taking a digital course, um, usually is what it is, is it's a digital course is a video or a series of videos and, um, selling it, you know, um, and then by selling it to somebody, when that person buys it, they not only get that video content, they get the rights to resell it. Um, you know, this one is one that I struggle with finding a lot of the pros on. I think there's the pros that you could uh, get some some kind of fast cash. But I see this as just kind of one of those shiny pennies. A lot of the marketing around it is like, oh, you know, get rich, earn $10,000 in 10 days. And anytime I see that, that's like a huge <laughs> red flashing do not pass go sign to me because all those things that start that way with this it's going to be easy. You're going to make all this money. You're not going to have to do much. Usually crash and burn. And um, the, just even I question, you know, the, the legality of selling the same video over and over and over through resell rights when there's no true consumers of the product, it's basically like a digital chain letter. So, uh, in that way, I mean, I think there's a lot of risks and cons that come with that. I think you have the potential to really damage your reputation so that you know, down your entrepreneurial life cycle, you find something that's truly legit. People might not trust you anymore because you've, you kind of, you only have so much credibility and you use that up. It's lost. Um, it's definitely does not seem sustainable to me. Uh, if you, it follows the patterns of other things we've seen throughout entrepreneurship that kind of have its, uh, heyday and burn. And then, like I mentioned, I think just the way it's set up, uh, is would we have we have a lot of experience in the regulatory environment if you haven't listened yeah. to our first few episodes yeah. so from everything that um we've very uh clearly gone through uh, uh a lot of red flags for me on this one yeah you know every time i see one of these and and you'll see these like i i see these when i'm when i'm on youtube and sometimes they're like the advertisement ahead of the video i'm watching will pop up and it'll be one of these that's that's going to show me like either like, like how to, like how to sell on Amazon or how to make, like you said, a, a, a whole bunch of money in a short amount of time. And the, the question that always goes off in my head is why would somebody, why would somebody sell me a course to do that instead of just doing, doing it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, yeah. And usually they haven't done it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so yeah. like, like on one hand, like if you show me how to do that, am I now competing with you? Or is this, is this actually more lucrative than what you're going to teach me how to do? And so it, for me, it's just a little bit of a, like, like you said, it's just a red flag. It's like, mm, I'm just not sure about this. And so I've, and that's probably yeah, why like it's, so that one gets a hard pass from us, but again, this is our own opinion. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is our opinion. If you're, if you've cracked the code on master reseller rights and you've got all the answers, you know, l reach out to us. We'd, we'd <laughs> We probably won't respond, but that's okay. We, we, we love you for it anyway. Um, okay. So the, ne the next one is like, I view as like the, the really um, the beginning of the democratization of, of entrepreneurship is franchises. And that was kind of the first thing on the scene where you could, you could tap into a brand and own something, but also, you know, have um, 
some kind of uh, success system for you. So I think the success systems are different per franchise, but I think there's some franchise as out there like Chick-fil-A, for example, where they truly have a great success system that people can plug into. Um, and it represents like true ownership of a business where some of these other things, no matter how many affiliate links you post, you're never really having any ownership, you know, of that, of, of the, of the brand you're promoting or, um, you know, side gig, you're not going to get really ownership of your Uber business, but in a franchise, you're, you're really building a business that you own. Um, and so it really represents true entrepreneurship. Some of the cons is that it's not as accessible to everybody. That's a large startup costs a lot of times, you know, usually it's over a hundred thousand dollars for some of the, the, the bigger brands and it can go, you know, well up from there. So it's not as accessible to everybody and it's pretty time intensive, you know, for some people they're having, they work three to five years plus before they even get that initial investment back. Well, but they've been building, you know, the ownership in the company, which is, is great. But unless you have the capital and the time to really invest uh, and building a true business, then it can be not as a, approachable, if you will, of of a business model. Definitely, all of those things, all of those things. I have I have friends who just bought a franchise, and there's so much that goes into franchising that that you that you don't necessarily think about. Like when if you if you go buy a franchise and you start selling sandwiches, for example, you think of the franchise as selling sandwiches, but really that's like the smallest part of right. the business. You know, like she's, she, her comment was, I bought a job. Like yeah. I literally bought a job. Like I'm there all the time. She's running to and from like getting business licenses, getting food handling licenses, like getting like all this stuff and like real estate and taking care of the the shop itself. Yeah. And it's, I've it's, owned a small business. You're like all the people yeah. rolled into one. You're the accountant and the head of customer service and the marketing department and the person who has to come in. And when somebody calls in sick, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You are. You're, yeah. You're the president, CEO and head janitor and, and like <laughs> everything in between. So it's, it is, I mean, and, and there was a, I think there was a time where like franchising was like kind of the golden ticket. Yeah. And, and I don't know that that's the case anymore. I think that, you know, if, if you're getting into franchising now, I think you just have to be really careful about what you're getting into and can you get that ROI? Obviously, one of the things about franchising is that the better the system, the more right. it costs to get into it. Because so true. yes. Yeah. It's like if like if you if you find a franchise for ten or twelve thousand dollars, you're kind of like, well, you know, do they really have it figured out? Whereas other franchises, you know they've got it figured out, but it's a million dollars to get started. Right. Not too many people have a, a million dollars laying around. And you know, if you do and you want to get into that, that's, that's great. But I think that there's, there's just, there's a lot that goes into franchising that really isn't about what you're actually selling. It's about everything but that. Yep. So the last uh, segment that we're going to cover is social selling, also known as direct sales. Uh, and I'm going to just cover the cons first, because obviously this is the, the industry that we have you know, the, the most experience in. Um, and so we, before we get through all the, the pros, um, I, you know, want to air out the cons because there can be cons. And like we said, any, any industry I think some of the cons in the direct sales model are that the, that companies can't have used the model to play games in terms of how they do their compensation. And it's less about selling a product to an end consumer, more about just recruiting a bunch of salespeople. Um, and there's risk for that salesperson based on that particular model. So if it's a model where you have to buy a ton of inventory and then you have to resell it, you know, there's tons of people out there that they call it, you know, garage qualify for business because they literally have a garage full of product that they couldn't resell. Um, and that is not great because then it leaves the risk with that person, the rep who bought all that product. Um, and it wasn't really moving the product to the end consumer. And so that is a red flag uh, when you look at companies, how they're set up. Um, also, if there's a ton of fees, renewal fees, a fee for somebody to become a customer, a huge red flag is if there's not even segmentation between who is a distributor of the product and who is a customer of the product, mm -hmm. um, you definitely need to have that differentiation because it's a very two different people 
one person, the customer is just buying the product like they would from any other brand. The other person has decided to represent the product to not only use it, but to sell it. Another red flag would be if you have to recruit other people to get paid on product sales. That would be another red flag. That should not be the way a model is set up. It should be that you get paid for selling product regardless if you build a team. And so I think because there are companies and some significant sized companies who really haven't used the model in its best way, um, then that's given the entire model, maybe a negative light to some people. So what I would say to that is that not all companies are made the same, just like not all franchises are made the same, like we just talked about, right? Not all companies are made the same just because they're in one uh, kind of umbrella of a marketing distribution channel. Not all companies are set up the same. So I know you've had a lot of experience with different setups in this industry. So before we get into the, the, the pros, you just want to kind of expand on what you've seen in terms of some of those things I was just talking about. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I, I totally agree with everything that you just said. I think that, that from, for most people, they don't necessarily know what they're looking for in a good direct selling company. And so, right. so people have had bad experiences. And, right. and in my opinion, direct selling companies that have bad reputations or people have bad feelings about them, a lot of times they they earned that reputation. That company earned the reputation. And like you said, if if they're requiring you to go to go recruit people in order to make money, or they're requiring you to buy a whole bunch of products, like those are big red flags. And I think sometimes people think of that as direct selling and use that as a reason not to look at direct selling or not to get involved in direct selling when they when they don't realize that not not every company is built that way. In fact, now a lot of companies are are kind of rejecting that idea and and looking at the future. The other the other thing that that I wanted to to mention as well is you know the the culture of the company that you're getting into. Like sometimes you get into a company and the culture is is just off. You know, it's like, like you're, you're never good enough. You're never doing enough. Yeah. Toxic. Um, <laughs> toxic. Yeah. And, and you're like, oh, but I started this business and then, you know, they're telling me I can do this, but then you don't feel good when you go to the meetings, you don't feel good. Like they're not providing like the value that you thought you were going to get. Right. And, and if that, you know, if you find yourself in there, my advice would be like, get out. Like, don't like if, if it feels icky, it it's probably icky. Don't do the mental gymnastics to make it better than it really is. Cause there are great options out there. And if, and if you find yourself in one that, that doesn't feel great, then maybe it's not great. And, and yeah. that's, that's unfortunately the case. Just like you said, like every industry has its good and it's bad and, and direct selling is no exception. There's great companies and there are not great companies and everything in between. Yeah. And in, you know, when we were creating Neora, we really were looking for how do we remove all these gotchas and, and really create a modern, social selling system that kind of takes all of those issues away. You don't have to carry inventory. There's no hidden fees. Um, you can get paid just for selling the product. And there are other companies that use similar models. So it definitely can be found. So in we're going to just really focus on the companies that are structured that way. They're e-commerce driven. You refer people to your website, you get paid. You're not forced to build a team. You're not forced to buy uh, a bunch of product. Um, yeah. so and for those companies, there's a lot of pros and that's why I'm really kind of passionate about, about those options is because it does check a lot of the boxes of some of these pros that you'll find in these different business models. Like it's flexible, very flexible. Um, you can do it when you want and it's, uh, it pays better for product sales. If you find the right model, then an affiliate and an affiliate model, you're making five, 10%. I cannot speak to, to our model, but it's, I think it's quite similar for people structured like ours, but we pay five to 35% on product sales. So you could earn more on the product you're selling. You also earn for the lifetime of that customer. So if a customer comes back, you continue to earn on that book of business. Um, I think one of the the coolest things in this model is the ability to build leverage of time, where if you do decide that you want to go beyond just selling product, you can, you shouldn't be forced to, but you can. And when you have also a team of people that sell product, that's creating leverage of time. 
Absolutely. I think that's one of the key things to look for is, you know, if you go out and you promote a product and, and a customer signs up because of, of your recommendation that that customer sticks with you, you know, that, and then right. in contrast with the affiliate program, like an affiliate program would say, okay, you got that sale. And that was a one-time thing. You know, this, this in social selling and direct selling, it gives you an opportunity to build a book of business and leverage. Like what, you know, if you're building a book of business, you're, you're creating some consistent cash flow over time. And the other thing is, you know, if you look back at the list of things that we were talking about from the beginning, like the market opportunity, like typically in direct selling or, or social selling, you'll find products that are in growth markets. And you'll find yeah. that in many cases, like the startup costs or the ongoing costs are, are relatively minimal, but yep. you want to look for companies that don't require a whole bunch of product sales in order to get paid or to get qualified to get paid. Cause I think that's what you were talking about, like leaves a bad yeah. taste in people's mouth. Yeah. And you're looking at, you're still looking at that same kind of equation of how quick can I get into profitability mode, which means how much is it going to cost me to get started? What is it going to cost me to continue to, you know, um, you know, keep my business running? What would I need to do in order to recoup that investment? I think some other kind of maybe um, lesser known benefits that are, that are found in this model. One is skill set development. I think, you know, there's so much training that's provided for free as a part of, you know, being a part of the, the, the brand, that company, so many just sought, whether it's soft skills, leadership skills, um, social media skills, like you would truly have to spend a lot of money on the outside world, um, in, in buying all these different courses to get that level of skill set development and mentorship, um, the community aspect of it, it's very much where you're not having to do it alone, where, you know, if you're driving an Uber, you're posting, you know, building your brand as an affiliate, a lot of that you're doing by yourself. So it's, it can get lonely and entrepreneurship is something that can be hard. So having a community, um, I think is really a cool aspect of it. And the last thing I'll just touch on is you truly do own that business that you build. It's a willable business. Like you can build something um, that you then can pass on to your, the next generation. I know you've seen this multiple times, generations and generations pass down a mm-hmm. business that was built, which is really cool because outside of maybe you know a franchise, none of these other options are really become something that you own, like you own the business you built and can pass that on. Yeah, for sure. I, I love the idea of, of building something that is, that is kind of long-term in, in its, in its essential nature, like building a book of business that stays in, you know, there are, and then the, one of the nice things about direct selling is that many companies have, have good products. And so you have loyal customers and they stick around because the products are good and they're worth what you're paying for them. And so when they keep coming back, that's an incredible benefit is to leverage the effort that you do in order to acquire a customer is, is that the company allows you to keep that customer. And so, you know, the longer you work your business, the more customers you can have and the more income you can generate as a result. And I think that that is, that's one thing, like if you look at the other options that are out there, there's not, there's never, there's not a lot of incentive or, or upside for, for customer loyalty. Like, like is, right. is there any customer loyalty in, in Uber or Lyft, you know, maybe, but it would be the exception, not the rule. And the other thing that I love about direct selling, social selling is that as you build this book of business and it starts to generate, you know, recurring cash flow, that it gives you options. It gives you things, it gives you an opportunity to do things that maybe these others don't have because the whole the whole idea around social selling is that it's you do it when you have the time and you put the time and the effort, the resources into that you can and that you want to. And if you want to build a really big direct selling business, you can. If that's not your thing and you want to build some part-time income or something smaller, you can because you know you you if you if you get a franchise, you you can't part-time your franchise. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an option on the box. Not yeah. really. Not really. You know, and and you can part time some of these other things, but but the more part time it is, more frequently, like the less leverage you have. It's like the more part time it is, the more you're trading time for money instead of trading your your time for something that is is a recurring business and cash flow. And, yeah. and I love I think that, that about this. 
I think that whole idea of parallel income and multiple income streams, that's becoming, you know, super top of mind and common right now. I think for a couple of reasons, I think people went through the pandemic and they thought I can't rely on just any one thing. Like, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Kind of mentality came over people. And then with inflation, it's just like for survival of like maintaining the same lifestyle they had, they need to have multiple income streams coming in. <clears throat> but one of the cool things, like you mentioned, if you're, you're building a book of business and you're getting a cash flow stream versus just like, I, you know, I drive an Uber, I get paid when you're, when you're creating this recurring cash flow stream around a book of business each month, then you can start setting some goals of what you want to use that for. So, you know, for some people, if you still have your full-time job and that's your income for, you know, kind of you're paying your bills and then you add a, a side gig and, and something that is like in a social selling model where you're getting that recurring cash flow, then you could take that and you could save it and you could do a lot of things that would be working for you. So you're creating assets instead of just more liabilities, right? You could put that in savings that's paying you. You can invest in stocks. You could save enough where you start um, getting a little small, you know, real estate, not something huge, but maybe you, you get a duplex, you live in one side and rent the other side. There's lots of options that become available to you when you can start saving some money and using that money um, instead of just having to, you know, barely pay, you know, your, your day-to-day -day bills. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I love the idea. And I try to, I try to teach my, my kids the same thing is like, spend your money on things that are going to pay you back, whether, right. whether in the future or, or sooner than that. Real estate is a great one, but it's capital intensive. And so, you know, social selling is a, is a great way to build an asset. And, and as your customers order and that cash flow comes in, like you said, you can save it, you can invest it. But, you know, ultimately, like if you can build up cash flow, whether it's through investments or or passive income, you know, passive income, whether it's, you know, your stocks appreciating in value or your real estate appreciating value or your rental income from like those are those are great things that you're not you're not trading time for money anymore. Now you're you're trading assets for bigger future assets. And I think that's one of the things that social selling does for people. Most people don't have access to invest in real estate, but but here's an avenue you could, you could develop this business. It's going to pay you over time. And you could use those, those, the, that cash flow to invest in real estate if you wanted to, or you could do a bunch, like you said, a bunch of other things. But I think that gives you that flexibility to do what you want to do with the income that you're generating. And the, and the longer you work it, the more you work it, then the bigger your book of business and the more cash flow you could create. And so I think it's, it's powerful for, for a lot of people who don't have a lot of money to put into a business and they're not, you know, they're, they don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in real estate. Like this is, this is something that, that one of the things I love about direct selling is that there's, there really is, there's no requirements for people generally. Like you, you, you could be from anywhere, you could live anywhere, you can work from anywhere and build a business. And, and that's, that's very cool. And it's a very powerful business model. And, and I think that's, that's why we're doing it. And the, I think it's the, you know, the slight edge approach too. like for us, our business model isn't again, like get rich quick. I think it, you know, that is, is that's not true for anywhere, for anything. It's more about what you could do with that slight. Like if you were even earning Five hundred, a thousand dollars a month, and you were able to kind of put that to the side and do something with it. How that compounds over time, especially if you're, you know, you're younger and you do that over ten years, twenty years. I mean, that is some powerful things that you can string together. For sure, for sure. Some of the one of those things that's super, super important to know, but not necessarily commonly known. So if there's, if there's anything you take away from this podcast, maybe that's the, maybe that's the point is, is to, you know, think about things, think about business, think about entrepreneurship a little bit differently where, you know, look at your options, look at where, you know, what are those options that force you to trade time for money? It, inevitably you're going to run out of time, but right. look at the options where you can build a book of business, build, like leverage your time into something that's going to be increasing in value over time. You know, you're, right. you're, that's where, you know, that's, that's, that's the magic that I see in this, in social selling and direct selling. That's like I said, up front, we're biased. 
we're happily admitting that we're biased. That's why we're doing, that's why we do what we do. Yeah. Um, that's why we chose our path. Right. But exactly. So in general, um, you know, there's a lot of people getting into entrepreneurship, right? The boom of micro entrepreneurship is set to happen, um, is happening. And when we look historically, you know, just over all of these different models, doesn't matter which one you pick more people, um, don't succeed than do. And why do you think that is like, why do you think that, that entrepreneurs, what are they missing when they get on that road? So like our hope is that no matter which path you choose, we can give you some advice that's going to help set you up for success. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of times it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's the things that you don't know as you get yeah. into a business that, that make it, you know, successful or not successful. So if, yeah, so that's, that's why we're having this conversation is just to help people as you're, as you're deciding. And if, if half of our listeners, cause that's a statistic, half of our listeners are planning to build a business or start a business in the next five years, here are some things to consider. So um, I think, and you know, we've worked with you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands combined entrepreneurs. For me, I think some of the things that I see of why people don't succeed is they're not able to make the switch from employee mindset to entrepreneur mindset. And it's a very different mindset. Like as an employee, people, you, you arrive at your job, somebody tells you what to do, you do it, you get you know, rewarded. Whereas an entrepreneur, you're expected to really be a self-starter. You're not going to have somebody telling you when to clock in and clock out. It gives you flexibility, but with flexibility, you have to create your own accountability to show up. Um, and that is where the second part, I think, um, you know, falls apart for some people is, is that it is hard work. Like no matter what path you choose, it is hard work, but there's so much upside potential. And, you know, there's this like anti hustle movement, which I, I get on some level because I'm all about like family balance, faith balance, work balance, all the things. But I also think it's become like an excuse for people that they expect big rewards without putting in the consistent hard work that it takes at the end of the day, hard work wins. Like if you're willing to put in the hard work and show up consistently, which is an entrepreneur mindset, like at the base core of all of entrepreneurs, you will find people who aren't afraid to work hard and are incredibly consistent. Like if you look at successful entrepreneurs, they all have different strengths, different weaknesses, different um, backgrounds of education. But the one thing that remains true is they consistently work hard. They're consistently solutions focused. Um, and they consistently, you know, put in that effort over a long period of time to get the returns. Because in any of these things, it's not about what happens overnight. It's what happens over that long term of of doing those things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that, you know, I, I, and I tell people all the time, like you, you, you're going to work hard. Life is hard, right? Like you, you can't just kind of like coast through life and get everything that you want. I mean, I don't think there's a formula for that, but one thing that I think will always be true. And, 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 and for the people that are like anti-hustle and don't want to do like, that's fine. Like that, you don't like, no one's going to force you to, but there's a, there's a rule that I've always kind of lived by, which is like, if, if you want what, somebody else has, you have to be willing to do what they've done to get that. So yeah. I think like, we don't want to set people up for failure thinking that you're not going to work hard, right. you're going to work hard. But if you're going to work hard, put that effort, put those resources into something that is going to reward you in return and not something right. that's going to let you down later or, or just force you onto a hamster wheel that you can't get off of in order to maintain that income. And I think ultimately, you know, you've got, you've got, as an entrepreneur, you've got to make your own decisions on what you're going to do or not do. But yeah, if you haven't listened to the slide edge, go back and yeah. listen to the slide edge episode. And sure. that's, that's how, and I think that, that regardless of the choice that you make, the slide edge will be relevant and helpful in your journey to get you where you want to go. That's a great point. We have people, you know, that are outside of even the models we talked about, real estate, insurance, brokerage, sports teams, um, you name it that read the slight edge. And that's really a core kind of some of the core entrepreneurial principles that they put in place. Um, and that's written by one of 
one of our other hosts of the Built Twin podcast, Jeff Olson. So if you haven't listened to the Slide Edge episode, that's a great place to start. And you can check out the book. It's available on Amazon as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in today as we chat a little bit more on our views on entrepreneurship, what's happening in the marketplace, the options in the marketplace, um, and how you can set yourself up for success. Truly, this whole podcast is meant to support entrepreneurs, whatever path you choose, and to give you the the knowledge, the mindset, um, the skill sets that you need to, to uh, be successful in whatever your chosen path is. So thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. And don't forget to refer a friend over here, like, subscribe, and re give us a review. And we'll see you next time. That was New York's Amber Olson Rourke and Dave Fleming talking about what it means to be an entrepreneur in today's environment and how to choose a side hustle that's right for you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if this is your first episode of Built to Win, we invite you to go back and listen to our story from the beginning. You can find us wherever you download your favorite podcasts. And while you're getting to know us, be sure to rate us and leave a review to let us know what you think of the show.